Hey guys, Scott Devine here from scottsbasslessons.com and welcome back to the second instalment of my Rick Beato inspired rundown where I take a look back at some of the most important bass players in the history of the instrument, the coolest instrument on this planet, give me a like if you agree, the bass. In part one of this series we looked at some of my favourite bass players from the 1950s and 60s who really embraced that shift from the upright bass, the double bass, to bass guitar. We were talking about people like Monk Montgomery and Shifty Henry, remember him from the Elvis video, through to Jet Harris, John Entwistle, Paul McCartney and Jack Bruce from the UK and obviously the legendary studio musicians in the US. But as the 1970s took hold came a new generation of bass players, a new breed who were really ready to up the ante. Now few bass players personify the spirit of the 1970s classic rock sound more than Andy Fraser of the band Free. Born in London in 1952, he will be forever known for his sublime bass solo on the band's biggest hit All Right Now from their 1972 album Fire and Water. Fraser was the master of the understated bass line. Simplistic riffs and short staccato notes delivered with the maximum punch on his awesome Gibson EB3. Elsewhere, the music of Yes and in particular the bass playing of Chris Squire obviously represented a completely new direction for the bass. Squire's crunchy Rickenbacker tone had never been better than it was in 1971 and luckily for us, when the band went in to record the Yes album, the engineer, a guy called Eddie Offord, clearly liked the bass to be loud, as it should be. If the Yes album asserted Chris Squire's total control of what was possible with the bass guitar, Fragile, the follow-up album from the same year, the same year, that's how they did it back in the day guys, really rammed the point home. From the opening riff on Roundabout, you just know that good things are about to happen. The fish is his excursion into multi-track bass, but it's Heart of the Sunrise that should be considered the essential listening on the album. It is a stroke of bass genius. Now next up is a band that was quite literally inventing heavy metal. Taking their name from the Hammer horror film starring Boris Karloff, Black Sabbath based their songs around massive riffs like songs like Paranoid, War Pigs and Iron Man. But how did they get that thunderous sound? The story goes that guitarist Tony Iommi had lost his fingertips on the second and third fingers of his fretting hand in an accident. He actually plays with his prosthetic tips now. So he'd tune his guitar down to D or even C to make things easier when he was bending the strings only to discover that when he played through a Marshall stack, the resulting tone was way heavier. And the bassist and lyricist Terry Geezer Butler, taking his inspiration from Satanism and Paranoid Insanity, when they detuned to C sharp, C sharp on the 1971's Master of Reality, they single-handedly forged the template of doom and stone metal. Now following on from the likes of Carol Kay and the Wrecking Crew, among the second wave of LA session bass players to arrive in the 1970s was a guy who to this day has the most fabulous beard in bassdom, the amazing Lee Sklar. A bona fide bass icon, Lee has played on something like 3,000, 3,000 albums ranging from singer-songwriter duties with James Taylor to Full Tilt Fusion with Billy Cobham including this iconic bass line from Cobham's 1973 album, Spectrum. According to Lee, Stanley Clark was originally called in to play the session, but when he got together with Billy Cobham, there were just too many chops and not enough hunkering down on the groove, which is when Lee got the call and the rest is bass history. Around the same time, Chuck Rainey had been making his mark on the session scene in New York with artists like King Curtis and Aretha Franklin. Check out Rocksteady from Aretha's 1971 album, Young, Gifted and Black. But his move to LA in the early 70s at the behest of Quincy Jones actually resulted in even more landmark recordings, including this one by the legendary Steely Dan. While the music played, you walked by candlelight. Go to San Francisco nights, we're the best in town. Chuck had been in Hollywood for about a year when he went in to record the bass part to Kid Charlemagne and he played everything he knew, grooving hard with a relaxed feel that is super funky. Needless to say, obviously, he nailed it in one take. 
Best known for arguably the greatest ever recorded bass groove solo on a track called Voices Inside, Everything Is Everything from Donny Hathaway's 1972 live album, which was recorded at the Bitter End in New York. Great place, by the way. Willie Weeks is one of the original soul and groove masters. For Weeks, the 1970s were marked by sessions with David Bowie, George Harrison, Randy Newman, Stevie Wonder, James Taylor, The Rolling Stones, Ron Wood, and Rod Stewart. But it's that extended solo with Donny Hathaway that is still cited as his greatest ever performance. Now, speaking of groove masters, my personal favorite, Anthony Jackson's reputation as an A-list session musician is second to none. Founded on decades of exceptional bass work with the likes of Shaka Khan, Paul Simon, Roberta Flack and numerous luminaries from the jazz world, it was his picked bass line on the OJ's 1973 hit For the Love of Money, his wah wah Fender bass with producer Leon Huff's addition of a phaser effect that cemented his place in bass guitar history. <laughs> By this time, more and more players were elevating the bass guitar and dispelling the notion that it was a second-class instrument. In New Orleans, George Porter Jr. was soulfully laying the foundations for the Meters, one of my favourite bands. You've no doubt heard of Sissy Strutt, but check out his bass playing on their 1972 album, Rejuvenation. It is stellar. Now with the funkiest of bass lines and the grooviest clothes, Verdine White of Earth, Wind and Fire was also hard at work creating some of the most influential albums in music history. Now in Oakland, a bass player whose groove defining use of muted 16th notes was also creating a signature style all of his own, something that I've been trying to get down for years, something that guys like Jaco Pistorius, you know, took it on themselves to get into their playing. A living legend of groove, Francis Rocco Prestia. And in 1973, he came up with one of the most iconic funk bass lines of all time, the bass line for know? What Is Hits. <laughs> Now there must have been something weird in the water around Oakland at that time because born just a few years before Rocco was an equally as groovy Paul Jackson whose dirty tone courtesy of his Fender Telecaster has stood the test of time. In 1973, his bass playing on the Headhunters classics like Chameleon and Actual Proof all incorporated harmonics, double stops and string bends, which are essential additions to any modern bass player's skill set. Also in 1973, down in Kingston, Jamaica, the Whalers were about to make waves with their debut release for Island Records, Catch a Fire. Many people have asked what reggae would have been like without Bob Marley, but equally as important is what Bob Marley's music would have been like without the rock-solid bass playing of Aston Family Man Barrett. Now Barrett's nickname came about before he had any children, but since that he has fathered, check this out, 52 children, 52. He was the band leader of Marley's backing band along with his younger brother and so started to call himself Family Man. He played a huge part in creating the sound of the Wailers and his bass lines went on to give Marley's hits just their whole vibe right through the 70s. Next up is a self-proclaimed rhinestone rock star doll, someone who has reportedly has paintings of Michael Jackson, Marilyn Monroe and Snoop Dogg hanging in his house. By the mid 70s, Bootsy Collins had already cranked out some killer bass lines for James Brown on tracks such as Get Up, I Feel Like Being a Sex Machine, Soul Power, and his hook laden bass grooves on Parliament Funkadelic classics such as Up for the Downstroke, Aqua Boogie, and One Nation Under a Groove. And they became synonymous with American funk and later formed the backbone of hundreds and hundreds of hip hop tracks. Bootsy was also the ringleader of Bootsy's rubber band, whose songs like Stretching Out in a Rubber Band catapulted Bootsy, along obviously with his star sunglasses and space bass, to the top of the R&B album charts. Now in the early 70s there were a couple of bands that were following on from the electric jazz experiments of Miles Davis, namely some of my favourites, Joe Zownall, Wayne Shorter's Weather Report and Chick Corea's Return to Forever. Now we all know about the killer bass players that came forward with Weather Report, but it was the early Return to Forever albums that brought to the forefront the lightning fast double bass chops of the amazing Stanley Clark. 
As the 70s rolled on, together with the advent of Alembic's custom-built basses, Stanley took his newfound electric bass technique to the forefront of the stage. Released in 1976, his third solo album, School Days, if you've not checked this out guys, you've got to, is essential listening for every bass player. The cover sees Stanley in white flares with Jimi Hendrix Afro-style hairsprayed painting polycores onto a New York subway wall. Very, very hip-hop. The Jimi Hendrix of the electric bass, Jaco Pistorius, simply redefined the possibilities of the bass guitar. For starters, Jaco was the first person to really give the fretless bass a sound of its own by ripping out the frets of his 1962 Fender Jazz, the bass of doom, and stringing it with round, round strings. As for his facility, what can we say? Jaco was wrapping his enormous double-jointed digits around melodies that were still giving sax players problems. His compositions and arranging chops were also phenomenal. Jacko's Watershed year came in 1976, a year that saw the release of his self-entitled album, Jacko Pistorius. If you've not checked the album out, you've just got to do it. Check out tracks like Donna Lee and Portrait of Tracy, which features his extraordinary use of harmonics. Now, as the album was being recorded, Jacko actually made a foray into rock and roll after meeting Ian Hunter, who was the singer of English rock band Mott the Hoople. Jacko actually played bass on his second solo album in 1976 called The All-American Alien Boy. Also released in 1976 to many, Joni Mitchell's album Hegira is Jacko at his absolute best. And also in 1976, Jacko recorded with Pat Metheny on one of my favourite albums, Bright Size Life. But perhaps most important of all was his debut with Weather Report playing on two tracks from their 1976 album Black Market, Cannonball and his own tune, Barbary Coast. Now fast forward a year and Jacko's bass playing on Weather Report's Heavy Weather album sealed his reputation as one of the greatest bass players to have ever lived. From the pinched harmonics on Birdland to the sheer technical brilliance of Teen Town or his mastery of soloing on Havona, it is still one of the most exciting wake-up calls for young bass players everywhere. Now before we move on, I just want to give a shout out to Jacko's predecessor in Weather Report, the amazing Alfonso Johnson, who you can check out on albums such as Mysterious Traveller, Tailspinning and Black Market. Now my top track from Alfonso has got to be Cucumber Slumber from the 1974 Mysterious Traveller. Okay, so how do we move on from guys like Jacko and Alfonso Johnson and Stanley Clark? Well, in Bernard Edwards, we had a bass player who demonstrated once and for all that the coolest of bass lines weren't just happening in the jazz world, but they were happening in the disco world too. Go listen to Thinking of You by Sister Sledge, or what is simply one of the best bass lines of all time, Good Times, from Sheik's 1979 album, Risque. Edwards was one of the best hookline bassists on the planet, and while retaining maximum fatness with his signature music man tone. Now, meanwhile in the UK, Outlandos D and More by The Police marked the arrival of a brand new bass talent. It's probably fair to say that Sting came up with more interesting bass parts later on in his, in his career, but his phrasing and his less is more approach on that specific album, particularly on tracks like Roxanne or I Can't Stand Losing You, remain a masterclass for bass players everywhere. And if you are still skeptical of his bass brilliance, go check out the weird yet wonderful Masoko Tanga. In their mid 70s heyday, no band had more potential to make the world their own than Thin Lizzy. Named after a dandy comic cartoon creation, Tin Lizzy, their 1976 album Jailbreak was chock full of dynamite songs, including one track that showed off Phil Linnett's bass playing vocal and song writing abilities in one single setting. Obviously, the boys are back in town. One of the earliest examples of dropped E-flat tuning, and an interesting thing about this song is that it mixes typical heavy metal five chord harmony with whole chunks on the size of the force. Ideally, if you're trying to get an authentic Lizzy bass sound, then you should use a plectrum on a precision bass with round, round strings. And if your P bass is black with a mirror scratch plate, you're gonna have the look too. Before we wrap things up, for the 1970s, I think it is really, really important that we pay tribute to what I think is one of the most influential movements in music history. I still hear a lot of people say that punk rock isn't important and the guys of punk rock bands couldn't even play their instruments, they couldn't sing, but the truth is that these bands were really, really important as they inspired so many people who suddenly realized that you didn't need to be able to play to be in a band. You just had to have something to say. 
It all began in the 1970s with bands like the New York Dolls and Television. In fact, it was television bassist Richard Hell with his spiky hair and ripped clothes that caught the attention of the future Sex Pistols manager, Malcolm McLaren, who in turn then took that style back to London. Punk remained on the underground scene until 1976 when two bands, obviously the Ramones and the Sex Pistols, made the outside world sit up and take notice. And in bassist D.D. Ramone and Sid Vicious, they are two bona fide punk rock icons. They played fast-paced short songs packed with angst and frustration about the social and political conditions of the time. When I think about the Ramones, I always think about songs like 53rd and 3rd, Warthog, Poison Heart, all obviously written by D.D. Ramone. And as for Sid Vicious, he was brought in by the Sex Pistols manager, Malcolm McLaren, to replace the original bass player, Glenn Matlock, even though he didn't even know how to play the bass. Despite the group's biggest single, God Save the Queen, being banned and many retailers actually refusing to sell the resulting album, never mind the bollocks, here's the Sex Pistols, there was no denying that they struck a chord with punk music fans around the world everywhere. Sadly, Sid's entanglement with drugs and his infamous relationship with Nancy Spungen ended his career. He died of a drug fueled overdose in 1979. If there is a sound of punk at its peak, then it is surely the bass playing of J.J. Burnell. His distorted bass sound rattled the rib cages of young punks everywhere. In true punk tradition, he may not have been regarded as a muso, but he did revolutionise the bass sound as we know it. Always forward in the mix of Stranglers records, it was the combination of his Fender P bass, rotary sound strings and the high watt guitar amp that gave him that signature sound. You've got to check out their album, Rattus Norvegicus of 1977, and in particular, the bass parts on Hanging Around the Peaches. The only member of the Clash who was in the band from the very beginning to the bitter end was Paul Simonon, and he couldn't even play bass when he first joined, but what he lacked in ability, he made up for in style. He looked the part, he wasn't afraid to take centre stage and he threw his bass around like he was Pete Townsend. If you Google London Calling by The Clash, you'll see exactly what I mean. Released in 1979, the album cover remains one of the most iconic images of a bass player ever. While you're at it, check out the track Guns of Brixton from the album, which Paul wrote. The bass line actually was later used by Beats International for their number one UK hit album, Dub Be Good To Me. Heavily influenced, obviously, by the Sex Pistols and the pioneers of the post-punk movement, Joy Division's first album, Unknown Pleasures, released in 1978, would have been, I don't know, pretty uncomfortable listening if it had not been for p -Tuck's deliriously catchy bass lines. Tracks like Disorder, She's Lost Control and Shadow Play became the first songs that a generation of new bassists learned to play. Peter Hook turned the bass inside out and upside down. And obviously he rocked a seriously long strap as well. So guys, hopefully you enjoyed this video. I am sure, I am positive that I've missed somebody out. If I have, let me know in the comments so we can give them a shout out and make sure they don't get missed. And let me know in the comments, you know, do you want more videos like this, more sort of like historical based videos and player biography videos and all, all that fun stuff? Let me know in the comments because I'll be going through them and taking action on what you actually want. If you don't know who I am, obviously, Scott Devine from scottsbasslessons.com. Go check out the website if you haven't already. It's the largest and coolest online bass school there is out there, and you can grab a completely free 14-day free trial, so you can take the thing for a test drive just to see if it's for you. As always, take it easy, and I'll see you in the shed.